Today, our guest is Mark Leslie. Mark was the co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Verta Software. He took the company from inception to over $1.5 billion in revenue. Uh, Mark also lectured at the Stanford Graduate School of Business for 21 years at an extremely popular course on founding, growing, and scaling companies. And as a busy guy, he's an investor at his own venture firm, has served on uh, 50 public and private boards, is a director at Stanford Healthcare, and is also a trustee at NYU. What do you not do, Mark? Um, he's also a leader of whom people say I'd gladly work for any company Mark ran. Uh, welcome, Mark. I look forward to our conversation. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me. And I just want to, if I might, add to the introduction to say, in addition to a lot of revenue, we generated $400 million of operating profit, uh, a virtue that's been lost over the last 10 years. <laughs> operating profit, super important. Thank you for that clarification. Great, let's get started. Um, you have a deck of leadership principles called Some Things I Learned Along the Way. Would you share a bit about this deck and how you developed it? Well, I view leadership as a journey, not a job. Uh, being a CEO is a journey, not a job. And uh, at the end of my um, term at Veritas, I collected my thoughts and put them down on paper. And then since that time, I've kind of added to that over time. And what I've learned is, is that you get uh, insights, even epiphanies sometimes about how things work and what it is to be a leader uh, that you just don't understand when you start out. And I would say, um, I'm still learning. I'm still, in all humility, I'm still learning. I'm still, uh, you know, we talked about something I've kind of thought about recently and added into my you know, repertoire of thoughts, right? Um, so it's a journey. And I think it's an exciting journey. It's intellectually fascinating. Um, it's very rewarding to be able to motivate people, inspire them actually. Um, and um, I've enjoyed the journey. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you're collecting all of these epiphanies from your journey. And then this deck uh, you're using to motivate and to educate. Uh, where have you shared this deck before? Uh, I always present this in my teaching as my last lecture. Last lecture in business school has a kind of a special meaning to it. It's the, it's the kind of greeting card you send to your to your students on the last day. <clears throat> Hopefully, something to remember you by. But my observation is interestingly is that the longer people have been in the job of CEO, the longer they've been in the business, and the longer they've been a CEO, the more they actually have to kind of relate to and are moved by the content. So for the students, it's an academic kind of uh, exercise. But for people in the trenches, it actually has meaning to them. Well, many of our listeners are CEOs who are in the trenches. I think this will be very meaningful to them. And so um, I'd love if we could dive into some of the principles that are in this deck. And I've looked at it and I found it very meaningful myself. Uh, one of the principles that really resonated for me was uh, the higher up you get, the fewer decisions you should make. And then another one is the further you are from a problem, the less you know about it. Then many of our CEOs find it challenging to trust and to delegate effectively. So will you talk a little bit about these principles and say what advice you would give them? Well, let's talk about the higher up you get, the fewer the decisions. Let's talk about them one at a time. Let's parse it a little bit. Um, so uh, when I finished my journey at, at Veritas, I had 6,000 employees. And everybody was out hopefully doing productive stuff that was in the interest of the company. And many of them were making decisions day to day. And I had no idea what was going on. It was, um, you know, you, you, you inspire people, you motivate them, you educate them about the mission and the vision, you, you educate them by example of how you behave, uh, and then you hope they do the right thing. Uh, now, I also believe that when you, um, the, the fewer the decisions you should make uh, has to do with training people to make decisions and to take responsibility. Um, you know, a simple example, uh, when I collected my management team for the first time and we would meet in a room um, and somebody would put an issue on the table and I wouldn't say anything. And everybody turns around in that room and looks at you waiting for a cue to find out what you're thinking and where you're going so that they can kind of decide whether they 
want to agree or disagree, but generally they want to kind of get a cue and find out where things are going. And my motivation for doing that was to say, I want people to speak their mind. I want them to feel free to do so. I don't want to preempt other people's opinions by expressing mine, because mine, by virtue of position, carries more weight. Uh, and I asked them to do that. Now, I gave you the example, I think, when we talked about, you know, people come into my office every day and, and, and ask me to make a decision. You know, 20 times a day, people walk in and say, like, well, should we do this or this or this, right? They come in and they say, simple example, you know, with Christmas party, should we serve a uh, cake or a parfait? And I listen to that and I say, you know, because they think I might have an opinion, right? And I, in, in fact, I don't have an opinion, but it's more important that, you know, I could express an opinion. I could say, well, I like parfait. And of course, then you'd have parfait. Um, but what happens really is I say, look, I said, you know, I, I, I think you guys have spent a lot of time on this party. You've thought about these things very carefully. Uh, you have a lot of other things going on. Why don't you decide whatever you want to do? And I'm okay with that. And when that happens, people, they kind of, you know, feel pretty good. They kind of, you know, stand up straight. They walk out, they're like an inch taller. And they go home that night and they talk to their significant other and say, hey, I went in to see the CEO and we were talking about this thing. And they said, I should make the decision. And it gives them the confidence to say, it's okay. Now, along with that, you have to have tolerance for imperfection. And that's something that a lot of young CEOs don't have. Everything has to be like perfect, right? But you're never going to get perfection. And you have to get something that kind of approximates goodness. And when you can approximate goodness by getting people to make the right decisions, even if they're imperfect, that in itself is a virtue. Tolerance for imperfection. And what advice would you have for, for first of all, I love that story about the parfait and the cake. <laughs> that resonates. And so at, at some point, how do you decide then when it's a cake versus parfait question and when it's a big issue question? Another little story. I, and this, I, I really enjoy this one. We had a very, very big IT problem in the company. Uh, our system for booking orders came to its knees and we were at the end of the quarter and people would put in an order and it would take 10 minutes for the system to respond. They'd go get coffee. And we had thousands of orders. It was really, really difficult problem for the company. So we told the people who were running the project, so go out and figure out what to do and come and tell us. And, you know, they came in a month later and they made this one hour presentation. They said, we have a son 4,000 and we should upgrade to a son 6,000. And of course they were worried that, you know, they didn't want to be too aggressive and everything like that. So I listened to this whole presentation and I, and I said, you know, maybe we should upgrade to his son 10,000, which was five times the price. And then I said, maybe we should get two, just in case one breaks. Now, it was an interesting moment in time because I can do a calculation. This is an example where I, did, I kind of stepped up and made the decision. I can do a calculation that they can't do. I can say the cost of increasing our capital equipment is de minimis as compared to the company not serving its customers, missing its quarter, and having a financial catastrophe. So we were basically underwriting risk, and the people in the project couldn't see that, right? But one of the things that happened from that is I gave them license to be more aggressive in the future, to be more bold and to take more risk in the future, and to walk into the, you know, the executive committee and feel like they had a, a shot at being a hero rather than a bum. So what you're talking about is when you have the perspective that they can't see, then that's when you make the decision. And then also you then modeling the behaviors you want them to be able to take in the future. I almost never did that, right? It's rare, but that also is, a, is, is instructive, right? Yeah, it's instructive that it's rare. Uh, so uh, on average, you'd be making these types of decisions and stepping up uh, it sounds like very seldom. Correct. I think you shouldn't make a lot of decisions. I think your job as a leader is to get people to make good decisions. That's your job. Your job is not to make decisions because it's a system that fails by, by the weight of the number of decisions that come your way. Mm -hmm. There's a lot yeah. of people who are in leadership positions are very proud that they, they sign every check and 
and every invoice and everything like that. And, you know, they're, they're, they're very proud of that stuff. And I think that's kind of ridiculous. You just, it's not scalable. The word scalable is really interesting because for a lot of our CEOs, they are, they're challenged in trying to shift to this mode of thinking because they've been, you know, individual contributors. They've been product people for a very long time, or at least that's how their career started. At what point do you think they should start flexing this muscle of delegating, making fewer decisions, letting other people make those decisions? Well, to the extent like you want to kind of exercise any muscle to make it stronger, they should start start early. Start early, do it often, get many reps in. Yeah. So a related concept from your deck is the further you are from a problem, the less you know about it. Will you say more about that? When there's a problem that arises in a company, um, a customer's situation blows up. Something that happens in every company every week. Not that they're bad companies. It's just you have enough customers and you have enough situations, things blow up. Um, and the job of the company, of course, is to mitigate that and to make those customers successful. So who knows what's going on? Well, uh, one of the people that know what's going on more than anybody else is the person standing in front of the customer. That would be the account executive. And another person that knows what's going on really well is the guy who wrote the code. <laughs> like those two guys know more about this problem than anybody in the company. So um, when when you look at these two people and then you go ask their managers what's going on, those managers know less than each of those individuals and they can only kind of give you a, a summary of that. And then when you go to their managers, they know even less. And then when it gets to the, you know, three more levels up to the CEO, I got a bunch of people who don't know anything talking to other people who don't know anything. So the higher up you get, you simply don't know, you know, each level up knows less about the specifics. They know, look, you replace the situational knowledge with experience, judgment, uh, and uh, hopefully wisdom, right? That you have seen so many things and you have a sense of the right way to go. But you can't know everything because there's just too much to know as the company scales. So when we had one of these situations where that customer situation blew in, we kind of called a meeting and we had at the meeting the guy who wrote the code, the account executive, their managers, their managers, and their managers. Everybody's in the room. And those are the people that have the real knowledge. Now, it's not only important to have them in the room to find out what's going on, but it's important to have them in the room to find out what the right solution is. And for them to walk out of the room with conviction that this is a problem that was well thought through and they can stand behind it, both in the work they have to do in development and in the messages that they have to send to the customer. So. If you have the humility of saying, I don't know much, and you get these people engaged, and you get to a better decision as a result of it, um, those people will then be able to represent the company's interest in a much more effective way. And how do you guarantee that they're, they're walking out of that room comfortable that that decision was well made? Because it, I can imagine the dynamics in the room are, they're there, the guy who wrote the code is there, the account exec is there. And then their managers are also there. They have all these layers in between, and then the CEO of the company is sitting there as well. How do you make it safe enough for them to say, oh, this was, this was a problem that was well treated, well addressed? Well, it's really simple. I don't ask their manager or their manager's manager or their manager. I turn around and ask the two people in the front line and say, well, what do you think? You know, you think you can, you can fix the problem, you know, technically? You think you can represent this to the customer? Is there something different that you think we ought to do? Let me know. And I get them engaged in the conversation as equals in the conversation. When, when you have a problem in a room, the hierarchical system doesn't represent the informational system. The informational system is more important. And the people with the information are at the bottom of the hierarchy, not the top of the hierarchy. This is a really interesting concept that the informational system and the hierarchical system actually uh, that one supersedes the other when you have a problem. No, they're in they're inverse, right? They're inversely they're inverse. proportional. Inversely proportional when you have a problem. And so this is this I this actually translates into an operating principle you could actually tell people to use. So when you have a problem, think about what the information hierarchy is as opposed to the actual kind of corporate hierarchy is and use that to problem solve. Well I think you're going on to an issue that's near to my heart, which is called trust. Yes. Can we talk about that? 
Let's talk about trust. Okay. So I think great leadership is um, a function of trust. Great leaders are trusted by the people in their organization to make the right decisions in good times and bad. And it's easy to be trusted in good times and it's much harder to be trusted in bad times when people, when you ask people to step up and say, trust me, I will take care of you, right? You are as a CEO, the keeper of the well-being of the company. Uh, and I believe that you build trust by trusting first. And I gave you the example when we had people in a room and I turned to the people who, you know, write the code and talk to the customer and ask them their opinion. I'm expressing trust. I'm saying, I trust that you are doing your job and I believe you and you have good judgment. It's maybe not perfect. Maybe I can ask you more questions. Maybe I can help you think about it a little bit, but I trust you, right? Uh, I think as a leader, you have to trust first and you have to trust often. Um, you know, one of the very precious values we had in our company was we were, um, we told everybody everything and we were very authentic about it. Will you tell us a story about how? I have a little story. Yes. Um, this is very early in the days of the company. We had, you know, maybe 35, 40 people in the company and then, you know, maybe 28 of them or 30 of them were engineers. It was an engineering company, not unlike many young companies in the world today. And um, we had come from a restart of an old company and it was a, it's a very complicated capital structure that we ended up with that we had to clean up. And we were sitting around our, our executive staff meeting and saying, you know, we know someday we're going to have to reverse split the stock. And it feels disingenuous to make offers to people of 10,000 shares when we really know someday it might actually truly be 5,000 shares. Because when you make an offer, everybody, you know, multiplies the number of shares by 100 to see what this might be worth in the future. And that just simply wasn't true and it was misleading. And I, I believe in a company you should try to do the right thing and have integrity. So we had this discussion about it at the staff meeting and we all agreed that we probably should reverse split the stock. But then the objection came up, which was, you know, the engineers are going to be very unhappy. They're going to be mad at us. And so we talked about it for a little while. And I said, well, why don't we just let them make the decision? How would that be? They didn't think that was a great idea. I said, well, let's try. So I walked into the engineering. To the, we used to have a management meeting in the morning and then a, a company meeting in the afternoon. When I walked into the company meeting. I held up a $10 bill and I said, uh, is anybody, and everybody, of course, a little suspicious because there's a little, a little, little trick coming, right? And uh, I said, walked in and said, does anybody have a five, you know, two fives? And nobody wanted to play. And I said, come on, like, come on, who's got two fives? So somebody finally said, okay, and we changed money. And I said, wait, before you put that away, could we change back? And they said, okay, kind of, you know, and okay, so we changed back. I said, so you're indifferent whether you have a $10 bill or two fives? They said, yes. I said, good. So we're here to talk about a reverse split because, in fact, that's exactly what it is, two fives and a ten, et cetera. And I said to the people in the, in the, in the company meeting, I said, what we're going to do now is we're going to tell you all the reasons why we think this is the right thing to do. And we're going to give you an education about how a company goes public and what it means in terms of the stock price and how we get from here to there and valuations. And this is all, this is, you know, back in, you know, the, the early 90s. So it was much more, much less, you know, today a lot of the stuff is current, but it was much less current at that time. So we spent about an hour and we went through this lengthy education. Uh, and um, and then, you know, they weren't ready to make a decision. I said, hey, no rush, you know, you know, we can do this next week. So we reconvened a week later. I said, come by the office, go talk to the CFO if you have questions. And we all got back in the room and they had one outstanding question and or concern i should say they said look we we're out hiring people and we have to make competitive offers and if our offer is half of what it would have been otherwise or in our case it's actually a third then i we may not be competitive we may lose the person and i said to them you know i said if you now tell them what you now know because you understand all this stuff and they go back and ask the other company about the same thing 
I think you have a very good chance of hiring these people because the other company is, you know, they're, they're, everybody was lying about, you know, how many shares they, they all reverse split their stock eventually, right? So they thought that was a good idea and they, they voted unanimously to reverse split the stock. Now, a couple of points here. First of all, I don't know of any company that's ever given the engineers in the company the right to make a decision about reverse splitting the stock. Because everybody thinks it's this magical thing that happens, you know, at the board meeting, you know, with the doors closed and everybody looking at the, at the chimney to see if a, a puff of white smoke comes out, right? So, um, so for, that's the first thing. The second thing, uh, I, I think um, uh, the, the idea that uh, the, the, the engineers, had I gone to them and said, we are reverse splitting the, splitting the stock and here's the education, no matter how long and how good that explanation was, somebody would have felt they had their, one or more persons would have felt like they had their pocket picked. And they would have felt like, what did they do that I don't know and what don't I, you know, et cetera. And this way, they didn't feel that way. They felt like they got to put their fingerprints on it. They got to ask any questions. And they had agency. Agency, giving people agency is building trust. They had agency in the decision. And it was a very, it was a very, you know, it's a small thing. It's kind of a little, you know, kind of footnote in our history. But it was a, it was a big, um, uh, act of building trust. I love these story because it illustrates just how you get people involved in decision making and how you give them agency as a way of building trust. Because that's a big question that comes up for our CEOs. So it's like, okay, that's this big, huge, squishy concept of trust and safety and, and creating the culture. How do you exactly do that? I think I mentioned this before. There's a, there's a bank of trust. Um, I'm not sure where it's located. I think it's virtual. You can make deposits in the bank of trust and you can make withdrawals from the bank of trust, but they don't make loans. So when times are good, if you think that someday times may be bad and that you want to call on that trust, if you haven't made deposits, there will be no trust there. And people will abandon you and they'll tidy, you know, in tough times, they'll tidy up their resume and the best people will leave. It's always the best people that leave first when, when you know, there's a threat. You're building your deposits in the bank of trust early on. Do it before you think you need it. Do it before you need it. Do it every day. Do it in the smallest ways. Uh, you know, I'll give you another example. Uh, we had, I don't know, two, three hundred people in the company and somebody from, you know, some, you know, administrator came in and said, oh, we ought to go put in, you know, badge readers and cameras and whatever. And I said, well, why do we want to do that? And they said, well, you know, somebody could steal a computer or, you know, a laptop or something. And I said, so what? So we'll go buy a new one. What's the big deal? And they looked at me and I said, look, it's more important for people to feel this is their home and they're free to come and go and that nobody is watching them when they put their badges on there to find out how many hours they worked. That's like a big brother watching you. And I said, it's not a problem. There's nothing here to steal. It's a software company. There's no... There's no capital equipment. They can take some computers. Not the end of the world. Everything is filed on the, you know, on, on the server anyway, right? So that's a, a simple example of thinking about it the right way. And so relevant nowadays when people, when you know, Big Brother is very possible, very easy to do. The question is whether you should do it. Yeah. Well, everybody's doing Big Brother now. It's really sad. So I'm a I'm a libertarian. So I don't I don't <laughs> like that. Um, going back to what you said about the puff of white smoke, you also told me a story about how um, how transparent you were. You know, we started our company out by saying, you know, every Monday morning, every Monday afternoon at two o'clock, we're going to have a one hour scheduled company meeting. It's optional, no requirement to go if you want to, if you're interested, come and if you're not, don't. Um, and every Monday afternoon, we would have a report to them. Uh, we also, in the you know, early on and you know, forever, forever after, uh, every quarter, every executive got in front of everybody and said, "These are the things I plan to accomplish that are me measurable metrics in the next quarter." And by the way, this is what I said at the beginning of last quarter, and this is how they came out. So, I thought that you know, giving them the opportunity to be to not humiliate themselves was more important than paying them. I paid them anyway, but. Nobody wants to stand up and say, I made all these promises and didn't deliver. So, so people are, are, are pretty good with their commitments. They make them and then they meet them. Um, but the company got bigger. 
uh, when we reached about 5,000 people, we sat down one day and we said, you know, this has always been kind of the way we self-identify as a company where we're open and people, you know, know what's going on. And we made the decision at that point in time that we were going to permit every manager worldwide uh, to sit in on our, our executive staff meeting that we had on Monday mornings once a month. So we got a, you know, got a phone service that let people call in. Nobody's allowed to talk. They could all listen. And we had our normal staff meeting. There were certain things that we didn't talk about because there were privacy issues and sensitivity issues. But for the most part, we talked about, you know, 85, 90% of what we normally talked about. And the first day we did that, you know, and everybody was like excited, right? Oh, we're going to find out what goes on in there, right? You know, so um, so the first day we did that, the lines were jammed and everybody was excited and everything like that. And three months later, like people stopped calling in. And why did they stop calling in? They said, well, they just talk about the same stuff all the time. What's the point of listening to it? And I got a lot of work to do, right? And so it was a demystifying exercise. It was a, an exercise to say, you know, we wake up in the morning and we put our pants on one leg at a time and we're just like you and we worry about the stuff that you think we're, that you, that you hope we're worrying about, right? Uh, and you get a chance to see it. And it was very, and it, it, made, it, it makes, uh, it's a very humanizing thing that people can have a sense of you as a person and how you talk in a group and everything like that. It was a it was a good thing to do. I, I never had any regrets about that. I love that story because I can't imagine allowing, you know, thousands of people to show up to a leadership meeting and then Well, five thousand employees we probably had, you know, it was for managers only, so we had a you know, we limited a little bit, but that word gets around everybody, you know. So um uh so we probably had, you know, four or five hundred people, you know. That's a lot, but it's not 5,000. Yeah, it, it is still a lot. <laughs> it's enough that everybody in the company knew about it and had a sense of it. I can imagine the excitement. And it's really funny that three months later, people were like, eh, I've got work to do. <laughs> yeah, I don't have time. I got, I got an appointment, you know, whatever. I mean, you know, the first time they made time for it. Now it's like, oh, I'm really busy doing something important and who needs this stuff anymore? It was great. And I think it probably died on its own after a while, so which was perfect. I mean, that's exactly the, the outcome you want, right? It's exactly what you wanted, yeah. Um, people aren't thinking about that puff of white smoke anymore. They're like, we know what happens in that, uh, is that convocation of cardinals? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but everybody, you go into a room, you close the door, and everybody says, what's going on in there? What are they talking about? And it's a mystery, and it's and it's... You know, I don't think people would describe it this way, but it produces anxiety, right? Demystifying. So thinking about going back to your deck, uh, what favorite principles would you pull out for our audience of startup CEOs? Leadership is about, you know, uh, building a great company. Um, it takes a long time. It's not about me. It's about you. I always believe in I don't like the word servant leadership, but I feel that way when I when I'm in the company. I feel like uh, my job is to care for each person and help them be the best they can be. Um, it's about trust, building trust. It's about authenticity. It's about um, being your real self. Not you know one of the things you that I that I worry about is that people get seduced by glamour. Uh, you know, I remember I used to be on TV. Uh, it's a public company. Every quarter, they call you up at CNBC and say, come in and talk to us, you know. Uh, it, it wasn't fun because, it, you know, I had a, I, they used to have me come on to talk to them at eight o'clock New York time because that was before the market opened. So that was five o'clock my time. And it took me a half an hour to get there. So I had to leave the house at 4.30. So I had to wake up at 3.30 to do this, right? To get prepared. You know, I had to look good and, you know, you know clean up, shave, you know, well-groomed, well all that stuff, suit and tie. Um, so, uh, but I, I, you know, at that point in time, I was, you know, pretty mature in my thinking about this. And I would think along the way, I said, you know, I'm, I'm not doing anything. I should, I should just say that when you go on TV, you know, the first thing you do is you, 
you kind of like sitting there and you go like, hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the next day you get, you get a phone call, you know, you get a phone call. It's like, hey, do you remember me? We were in the third grade together. I swear I got that phone call. We were in the third grade <laughs> together. I didn't know who it was, right? Uh, so, so people see you and, you know, you, you become a celebrity, right? You know, a little celebrity, not a big one. Uh, but I remember thinking that as I was driving there in the middle of the night, you know, a little groggy. Um, oh, by the way, when you go in there, it's not like it's not glamorous. You go, it's not like you go into a big studio and you go into the green room and you're you're sitting next to some celebrity, you know, commentator or something like that. You go into this tiny little one room place in Mountain View, which is all dark. Uh, and, and it's just a cameraman and, and you and they kind of put you together electronically. It's, just, it's really quite you know, uncomfortable, actually. But I used to think on my way in and do this stuff, and I was doing it every quarter, I said, like, I'm doing for my company in the middle of the night what the engineers do for this company when they're fixing someone's problem in the middle of the night. And there's no difference. And they're just as heroic, if not more so, than I am. And so I think celebrity is seductive. Um, and uh, I think that... Um, you know, I never use the word in my presentation, but it kind of works its way through many of the ideas there. I think personal humility is very important. Doesn't mean you're not a smart guy. Doesn't mean you're not successful. Doesn't mean you're not accomplished. But in your dealings with other people, I think you have to have personal humility. And I'm hearing that humility in the reframe that you had around this is a glamorous seeming presentation or interview that I'm having, but at its root, at its fundamentals, it is no different from the work that everybody else in the company is doing. We're all doing our bit to make the company succeed. It's just something I can do that they can't do, and you're doing something that they can do that I can't do. And that's how everybody contributes. And I looked at it that way, and it was no different to me. I love that reframe. Because it's so hard to do, especially now. It's so easy. Um, there's such a cult of CEO-hood, especially in the Valley. Um, I, I'm really enjoying this reframe into humility. Um, switching gears a little bit, you recently gave a talk at uh, Coastal Ventures, which is where we met, around the virtuous cycle of leadership that helped you make 44 consecutive quarters of growth at Veritas. Can you tell the audience about this cycle of leadership and share a couple of key takeaways that you'd recommend our CEOs keep in mind? So, what is, you know, I was, I was teaching this, I created this course along with a marketing guy called Building and Managing Professional Sales Forces. And one of the things about teaching is when you teach, you learn. You, you learn in the sense what you already know because you have to express it. You, you get to see it in a new light and sometimes you have an epiphany. And one of the things that I saw there that I wouldn't have seen if I wasn't teaching was that um, there's a relationship between the way sales is managed and the way the company succeeds, independent of how much they actually sell, right? I mean, in a sense. So... It goes like this, that you you give salespeople, uh, you set the quotas for the salespeople such that rough and tough 70% of the people make their goal. Now, that's very hard to do in a company when it's starting up because nobody knows what productivity actually looks like. But when a company gets more mature, you can go look at last year and say, you know, for every fully, you know, qualified salesperson, we have on average X productivity. So you actually know what the numbers are and you can't. They don't move very much in terms of, you know, we're going to do this program or we're going to change something or we're going to hire more people. It, it's pretty well, you know, kind of iced before you get there. So if you set the goal to 70%, what, what happens is that uh, some people make more than 70%, some people make slightly less than 70%, and some people make 30%. You fire the people that make 30%, which is a small number. And everybody else, the people who almost made goal, believe they're going to make it next year. And the people who made goal and made a lot of money are very happy. And you become a place that attracts good people. And you, of course, when they make their goal, you have to pay them. And you have to pay them competitively. Uh, I should say, as a side note, some of the engineers said, how come the salesmen make so much money and we don't? And the answer was always, if you want to go into sales, you can make that money. Oh, I don't want to go into sales. Well, that's why they make that money. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, uh, so, you, so, so you set the goal at, at uh, 70%. You become a place that, you know, 
uh, is successful. When you get set the goal at 70%, you have a good chance as a company of making the company goal. Uh, I believe there's nothing that contributes more to morale in a company than being on a winning team throughout the entire company, right? When you make the goal, uh, what happens is that you overachieve on your numbers. And when you overachieve, you can either increase your earnings and kind of get a bump in your stock or increase it a little less and get a bump in your stock and spend more money building new products and stuff like that. Um, and Or you can drop it to the bottom line. There's a lot of you know, good choices that you can behold at that point in time. When you do that, uh, all of those things, when you invest in the future, the future goes up. When you invest in you know, dropping it to the bottom line, your stock price goes up. When your stock price goes up, everybody shares in the benefit of that because they all have stock options. And the company has now a, a, a cycle a, a cycle of success, a cycle of winning, a cycle of, of, uh, of, of kind of making every quarter. I mean, we made every quarter and, of course, the company, and every time we make a quarter, you know, the stock goes up and everybody's happy about it and stuff like that. And that, again, kind of then goes back into the cycle of getting the best people. Everybody wants to work for the great companies, right? And so... It, it was a, it was something it started with setting the goals for the sales reps who would have thought that it's it's right it's a weird thing to think that's where the cycle starts that's pretty amazing uh, and then um what are a couple of key takeaways you'd share with the ceos around okay set set the goals because that sets the tone and sets the cycle of success up for the organization, anything else you tell them to make sure that they can actually execute on this and have it run? I always tell um, young companies, uh, you know, when you say we're going to do 9 million next year and the board says you really ought to do 11 million because we have to raise money and this, that, and the other thing, uh, and it's got to look right and it's, you know, the, the metrics are going to be good. and and you argue about it, I always tell the CEOs, stand by $9 million. And the reason I tell them that is because you probably come in at 10. And if you come in at 10 and you committed to 11, you're a goat. And in fact, raising money is harder because you didn't make your goals and they sit around and they say, what happened? And when you, when you promise nine and you come in at 10, you're a hero. And when people see that from an investment point of view, they say, hey, this company's got momentum. I want to invest in it. <laughs> so uh, there's, a, there's a, a bigger principle to this. And I tell this to one of the things I tell to, to CEOs all the time. I say, you know, if you, um, if you uh, don't do what your investors and board members tell you to do, you may or you may not get fired. But if you do what they tell you to do, you'll definitely get fired because they really don't know what's going on in the company and their opinions are not worth as much as yours. And you have to step up and believe in what you believe in and stand by your convictions and take a stand. And if you're not willing to do that, you can't be a CEO. You have to bet your job. And, uh, you know, sadly, I would say in this community of high tech startups, uh, the job, with, the job I know of with the least amount of job security is CEO. Yeah, for, for various reasons, right? There's performance, but then there's also just being a CEO is a tough, tough job. So if you don't mind my asking a more personal question, like how do you sustain yourself and how do you recommend other people sustain themselves? So what is a really, really difficult, challenging role? You have to reach a point where you don't care what people think. I don't know how to describe that. But when you're starting out, you... And, you know, you're in school and you're in college and you're whatever, so early in your career. And what other people think of you, your your peers, your managers, you know, whatever, matters a lot. But in order to, you know, I, in order to be a CEO, to be a leader, you have to be comfortable with the fact that it doesn't matter. You still got to do what you got to do. I, I always give the example of I talk to CEOs, I said, you know, when you go out with your team and you have, you know, you drink and you have dinner and everybody's very, you know, happy and we're having a great time and everything like that. And you leave. As soon as you walk out the door, they talk about you. It's true. That's exactly what happens, right? Because you are the thing they have in common. You're the thing that binds them to the company and to each other. 
And you have to be comfortable with that. You have to be comfortable if they're talking about you behind your back. Well, everybody's talking about you behind your back. And, you know, I, you know, hopefully they're not mad at you and hopefully they don't say terrible things, but you just have to not worry about it. You have to be comfortable with it. And uh, that for me, I, and maybe for many people, was it was a matter of maturity. It was a matter of, you know, having the, over time, building the confidence to be able to do that. It's not easy to do when you, when you're starting out when you don't have a lot of confidence and you may think you have a lot of confidence, but you actually don't. Right. So that's, I, I think that's one essential, essential thing. It sounds like a very specific type of confidence and maturity to be able to understand that people talk about you and that it matters sometimes. And most of the time it doesn't. They talk about you and they hold you accountable. Uh, I always, exp- you know, I, I spend much time, talking to CEOs about, I'm thinking about firing this person. I, I always, well, I got the situation, they're not doing their job, everybody likes them, you know, uh, you know I'm concerned about, it. They go, it's, it's a conversation goes all over the place, right? And I always say to them the same thing. I say, everybody in the organization knows what's going on. They know this person is not contributing to the level that they need to be, and they're holding you accountable. And that's true at every level. When you're a first line manager and you got seven people working on a project and one of them is a free rider, everybody knows. And if you don't fire them, they hold you accountable. So, you know, you have to go step up and do, and, and, and you have to recognize that. You to, not only, you know, I, I care about, I mean, I don't care what they're thinking individually, but I care about that I care because I feel I am accountable, right? I am the person my job is to go do the things that benefit the whole, not any individual, right? Mm, I think that's it. That things that do the things that benefit the whole is a theme that has come across. If you want a friend, buy a dog. <laughs> no, but when you're talk when you're talking about, you know, should I fire a senior executive, there is nobody to talk to. You can't talk to the other executives. You can't undermine that person while they're still there. You can't talk to your board because they're going to ask you the next time they see you, what have you decided? You can't talk to them just kind of like I'm thinking about it. You can't talk to your significant other or other people who are like that because they don't have enough context. You can tell them, you can talk for hours, but you can never explain all of the context and the, and the, and the sensuality of it, the, the, the feel of it, stuff like that. So you're alone in the decision and you're accountable. You're accountable to the people who are there, who have invested their trust in you. That's part of the investiture of the trust, is that they, that they believe you're going to do the right thing. And you have to demonstrate that you do. I definitely see a lot of the loneliness uh, in the clients and also the fact that these are really, really big decisions that the company is leaning on them and trusting them to make. And um, that's, what is, what, that's what an executive coach does. <laughs> that's why we're there. I talk to a lot of people, uh, a lot of CEOs, and uh, I would say that 50% of the things that are on their mind are the one I just described. Should I, what should I do about this situation with people, whatever, you know? And it's, it's very, uh, it, it's very, it's the most common thing that people struggle with because there is no one to talk to. People challenges are really one of the largest things that I see in the practice as well. Um, and, and yeah, being someone who can be there to help talk them through the challenge without it being you know, they can't talk to, like you said, board of directors, they can't talk to the executive team, they can't talk to their significant other. That's, um, that's a big part of it. All right, Mark, thank you so much for that. Um, before we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts? I do. Uh, one of them I already expressed, which is if you want a friend, buy a dog. That's a final thought. Uh, it's profound. It's, it's not, it's not, it's funny, but it's also profound. And I would advise people to think about that. Uh, you know, when, when you come home, your wife is mad at you because you forgot to get the milk and the dog is happy to see you no matter what, even if they're hungry and, you know, unhappy about something else, they're happy to see you. Right. So you want a friend buy a dog. Uh, the other thing, uh, which I think are words to live by, um, regrets for the things you've done in the past is tempered with time, but regrets for the things you've never done is inconsolable. I think those are words to live by. I live my life like that. And I think what it means is, is that you, at, you know, 
at, at any point in your life, you're surrounded by people. You're maybe your parents, your siblings, your your uh, friends, your 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 associates, your fellow students, whatever. Uh, and everybody has an opinion about what's worthy to do and what's not worthy to do. And I, I say to you that you know someday you're going to be at the end of your career. And the, the end of your life, not the end of your life, the last day, but, you know, kind of the later years. And you're going to look back and you're going to say, did I do what I wanted to do? Did I, you know, uh, accomplish the things I wanted? Or are you going to spend your time saying, oh, I could have done that, but, you know, I should have done that. But I think you don't want to live with what it could have, should have. I think at the very, at the very best, you want to say, I did what I hoped to do. But at the very worst, I think you want to say, at least I tried. And I say to the people that when you get to the, you know, the last quarter, let's put it that way, the last, you know, 25 percent of your life. The vast majority of those people you started out with are not there anymore. Parents die, hopefully, you know, the order of things. The people you went to school with, they went off and did their own thing and you don't see them anymore. And all those people that had opinions you're not there anymore and you have to talk to yourself and i think those are words to live by regret for the things you've never done is inconsolable i love that principle um and and to be able to say at least i tried at the end at worst at best see i did it at worst say at least i tried <laughs> thank you mark this was uh, wonderful. Thank you for sharing all of that wisdom. I really appreciate all of your stories and insights about how to be a better leader and how to actually live a better life. Um, it was a wonderful, it, it was wonderful having you on the podcast. Thank you.